Our next speaker needs no introduction whatsoever as he's appeared on various popular TV shows, including The Late Late Show with James Corden, Newsnight, and no less than 17 BBC documentaries to name just a few. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Lord Robert Winston, Professor of Science and Society and Emeritus Professor of Fertility Studies at Imperial College. So without any further delay, I will hand over the mic to you, so to speak, Robert. Thank you very much. Well, I feel um, totally out of my depth in this very, very learned company. So you're going to have to forgive me. I thought I would do something, I'd try and do something a bit different. And I want to suggest to you that one of the things that human beings don't do, at least certainly us, uh, we don't learn very well from history. And it's very interesting to consider, uh, you know, what's happened in the past. And I want to start, for example, with 1346 to 47, when the Black Death, Yersinia pestis, which was carried by fleas, uh, entered uh, Europe. But of course, we know actually that almost certainly from looking at the teeth of skeletons in Romania and elsewhere, the Cucutani tribe, for example, we know the, 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 in that culture, it's probable that Yersinia was responsible for uh, rapid decline and regrowth uh, of the population, maybe from as long ago as 6,000 BC. Certainly it's present in Neolithic cultures in Asia Minor, as well as in Romania and probably uh, some other parts of, 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 the far, of the East. The other thing that's interesting, I think, is that there's some suggestion that this bacterium, of course, because it's a, it's a gram-negative cocobacillus, which uh, is an anaerobe, so it's quite different from a virus, it's much bigger for one thing, but we know that it also uh, can mutate. It seems occasionally it can mutate. And it's possible also, interestingly, that the non-coding RNA may be responsible for its synthesis and also for the virulence of the organism. And that's interesting, I think, when we come to viruses later on. Um, the flea is undoubtedly the main vector, but hey, wait for this. Uh, various mammal species have certainly carried those fleas and have certainly been vectors. Certainly the rat, of course, which is most well known, the priory dog, the camel, uh, chickens, pigs, dogs, and particularly cats seem to be associated with Yersinia. I have to say that it was previously called Pasturella. Um, and most of us, I think, are probably not likely to get it. I've, when I was working with rabbits, uh, which I did extensively in some of my early reproductive biology, uh, much of my research was done with rab rabbits. And I know that I was handling Pasturella, a different species, but nonetheless quite close to pestis. And I never got even a common cold. And I think, um, I suspect that we're now probably immune to many of those, uh, of those bacteria. Interestingly, um, the, uh, this, this bacterium manipulates the immune system. I mean, of course, bubonic plague, of course, affects the lymph glands, but you also get the cytolysis that we see with the, with the coronavirus. And of course, macrophages uh, can change as well. And if we uh, go forward a bit now in time, I want to take a little bit of time discussing um, something which I think is really interesting, which I would suggest that you might want to read. It's certainly worth reading the Diary of the Plague Year, which of course is the Great Plague of London in uh, 1664, 1664 to five. Um, and, it, and the best account that I have been able to read, apart, John Evelyn wrote about it. And of course, uh, as we know, uh, Pepys, uh, the diarist also wrote about it. But the account which is most interesting is, is that by um, uh, Daniel Defoe. Uh, now he was only five at the age of the time of the plague. Uh, but he writes about it as, as a younger man later on, and he finally publishes his book, which becomes a bestseller very late in 1722. Now, what is fascinating there is that this plague is carried definitely by shipping, just as, of course, the Black Death was carried by the latest technology, i.e. shipping in those days in, in the 1340s, when it wiped out probably one third of Europe in some parts anyway. And people hid the illness and they self-isolated, sometimes voluntarily. But later on, this was enforced by the authorities and people were locked in their houses with a red cross on the door. We see that very clearly from the account. He has a lots of eyewitness accounts about this. So we don't actually learn from that history very well because what's really interesting, of course, about this is that probably the most dangerous technology we now have actually 
is the aeroplane. We think of it dropping bombs, not very relevant actually, or crashing. But actually, of course, within hours of being in an area where there is a, uh, a microorganism to which we have no natural immunity, it arrives in our country and it unloads people who will be carrying that particular pathogen. And I think that's an interesting point to consider now, of course, because I'm not sure how effective our barriers are at airports or uh, indeed uh, on seagoing ships. But certainly I think there's a lot to consider about really whether or not reinfection is quite likely through travel. And I think that's something which is worth thinking about uh, probably in the future. Anyway, uh, what, what, what happened of course was in 1347, the plague came across from Asia on ships. It was highly virulent and it spread extremely rapidly. Most of the population were completely defenseless, but some people did seem to have some natural immunity. Now, in the, in the Journal of the Plague Year, um, one of the things that's interesting about Defoe is that actually he does do a mathematical analysis predicting the diseases spread from parish to parish in the city of London. And he, he recognizes the need for sulfide isolation. And very, very interestingly, he describes a group of, I think, five or six youths in a pub who completely ignore social distancing, which is already becoming the norm. And of course, they just laugh at people who are infected in the street, even though there are bodies outside the window. These guys eventually all die because they get infected themselves. Um, and the infected people were by uh, local authorities confined for 40 days, hence the name course quarantine which is where we get that name from 40 and what I think is also interesting we've heard just heard this just now I mean Christina was just talking about it earlier uh, modern scientists are suggesting that COVID is unique because people are sometimes infectious well before they have any symptoms but judging from the history of this bacterium that I'm talking about and Daniel Defoe's account it looks as if a lot of people were certainly free of symptoms unless they were hiding the buboes, which they might have been. In some cases, they probably were. But actually, um, they actually could pass the infection on. So it's not unique to any, necessary to any pathogen. And apart from the deserted streets and parliament shutting, and of course, needlessly, the king, of course, uh, flees. Where would he flee to? But, but Oxford, of course, uh, this is Charles II. Uh, central government was completely useless, uh, which is an interesting point. Um, uh, the, the, the poor suffered most, but fortunately, the Lord Mayor of London stepped in with local government. And in fact, they did get some kind of proper containment of the disease. They provided essential support with food. Uh, meantime, uh, quacks were selling expensive cures. Uh, by the way, there was no mention of bleach anywhere. Fake news was very common. And Defoe describes a lingering painful death from the bubonic plague. But very interestingly, some people with no previous symptoms suddenly got pneumonic plague and died in the same day. So whether this is a new, new mutation is difficult to know or whether it's due to a particular lack of local resistance. But these were not elderly people or people who would be particularly likely to die. Some of them were quite well-nourished uh, middle-class or even upper-class individuals from the pneumonic plague. So that's, I think, quite interesting. Anyhow, the way it finished, it went it, with at least uh, 100,000 deaths, probably, probably more because they're likely to be un undercounted because many of the poor were just buried in large mass graves holding a thousand people. And, um, and of course, what was the big issue? Well, the big issue was that the well-off well continued protesting about the economy and the damage to the economy. Was it ever thus? And we're still seeing that now. And interesting, of course, that in 1665 to 1666, London had the most amazing rebirth with Christopher Wren. So in fact, actually the economy recovered much more rapidly than anybody could have possibly predicted. I think now it's interesting to look to see what we understand about um, uh, uh, about the, the virus uh, now. I mean, certainly, I think um, one of the issues, maybe what I might do is to share my screen with you. So basically, um, let's, just, just, let, let's just move on. I, I, want to, I want to suggest something to you rather important in, 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 um, 
1999-2000, I was chairman of the Select Committee of Science and Technology in the House of Lords. And one of the inquiries that I was responsible for starting was the question of science and society. And I, I, what I've done here is to list uh, 10 examples of scientific issues, starting with nuclear power, which we were particularly interested in then, and GM crops, which were a high pro problem. And you can see that each one of these 10, uh, 10 issues, which, have, which is most of course have cropped up since then, have been effectively debacles in, in science. They've been a, a, really a, 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 a huge issue in, uh, in, 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 in public understanding. So for example, if you take um, uh, nuclear power, um, in, in the 60s, we were, we were spending at least 600 million pounds on, on research from the Research Council. Uh, by the time I left uh, EPSRC as a, as a council member, we were spending only about seven million a year on research into nuclear fission and a little bit more infusion, but not much. So in fact, nuclear power had become something which people were so concerned about, they were very reluctant to implement it. Now, of course, we're well behind in that technology where we led the world in the 60s and 70s. And of course, the truth is, we did lie about the uh, the the radioactive waste that was being uh, uh, or the radioactive substances which which were coming out of power stations and there was a great deal of obfuscation about what was happening in other countries and that's true too of nuclear waste where of course we didn't really point out to people that the half life of the waste the the, the, the radioactive half life of the waste is immense hundreds of thousands of years so again there was a question I think there of mistrust, partly because of the failure of proper um, openness and information. With GM crops, um, I think that one of the big issues there were the massive commercial interests, which of course have still prevented us doing as much research as we could have done in Britain and growing GM crops, which have been would have been much more, uh, would be hugely then uh, uh, useful uh, to the world. Um, and BSC, I think was presented as a complete uh, a complete puzzle. Um, and certainly the way government ministers handled um, the lack of scientific knowledge was abysmal. Some of us will still remember John Selwyn Gummer in front of the camera feeding his six-year-old child with a large beef sandwich to try and show it was completely safe, which was didn't actually persuade anybody. That's, with foot and mouth, I think one of the problems was that there, there was massive lobbying as for example, it has been with the badger problem uh, from, from the farming community. And with animal experiments, I think there's been partly pressure from, uh, from uh, well, failure, I think, of uh, big pharma to be helpful to point out that actually we need to do animal experiments for any drug to be safe. I mean, we can make an exception with, with certainly with, with uh, vaccines, but it's certainly not true still yet of the things that we take as drugs, that's still the commonest way of looking before we do human trials. Uh, human embryo research, the problem there was certainly religious pressures and also the story that there were too many people in the world already, why do we want to try and get more people pregnant? But what's interesting there was that public attitudes changed overnight when we suddenly demonstrated the advantages of, uh, of getting IVF working and in particular, being able to screen for genetic defects. And, uh, certainly, I think uh, we saw it in my own lab where, in fact, we started doing pre-implantation diagnosis for the first time in the world using PCR by hand, of course, in those days, not now as we do it with, but a very similar technique to what is used to look for the virus now. Uh, uh, stem cell type chimeras, which were important, of course, for lots of reasons, um, were almost banned completely until we underwent some form of public dialogue. And what I think was interesting there was that the regulatory authority went through a 180 degree turn once it saw that we could that we could actually talk to the public and we could look at how our work was helping um, helping them understand and how they were helping us to understand the problems. Uh, what can we do as a society to prevent the loss of critical institutional memory? I think it's I think it's a really important question, and I think the answer is a complex one. I, I think uh, 
what we need to do increasingly is to understand that we've got to start much more when the brain is at its most plastic. That means actually, I think really, uh, I think it's really about education in schools, particularly, of course, in primary schools. And I and I think uh, that that loss of institutional memory um, it, it is partly. Um, uh, is my video working? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, I, I think is is part of the answer, but not all of it. But also, this is something which governments don't do uh, and never want to do because, of course, they don't want to look back at the reasons why they've failed in the past so often. And I, I think that issue of institutional memory is a, is 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 a big problem. Um, and I think what we will have to do more is to find uh, a better se sense of inquiry in our youngest population, really, when we lose it about the age of 11. So uh, I'm not sure if you had a chance to hear that um, when you uh, disappeared from us for a short while, uh, the co-chairs and I um, were reflecting a, a little bit on, on your talk so far. and. Um, one of the things that we were discussing too was around um, data and the, the dullage of data and how this is quite different from maybe some of the other crises where we've got social media and all sorts of other platforms, both where we're collecting maybe some of that institutional memory or um, that data is being used um, to help inform us. Uh, what do you think is different and what can we do as a, as a data science community, as a science community, that's that's different in our response potentially. We've got, we've got to talk better English. I, I, I think it, I think we've got to talk better English, and I think we've got to listen. And you see the problem now today. We're sitting here feeling really rosy because we're going to have a good Christmas and we're going to be completely released from this bug. But actually, when it comes down to the three vaccines, none of us have actually seen the data. And although the data are passing through, obviously, the right authorities, and we hope that, you know, things like the MHRA will work, you know, will work on it properly. The fact is, we're not being given a chance to see where it is. And, uh, and already, there is publicity. And of course, everybody wants a good news. And the government wants a good news above everybody. So actually, we can easily we can easily uh, really fail to allow um, different aspects of the public to really try to come to terms with the data. Um, what I wanted to talk about actually was the ethical responsibility with vaccines, because I think it's a very important issue where the data is critical. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping uh, that um, at the end of today that you'll come back and you'll speak to us on, on that front. Okay, yeah, well, with pleasure, of course. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. It wasn't. I thought it was my incompetence with the with with. But you know, I'm using I'm using this platform all the time, and I couldn't I couldn't believe why I couldn't get my share screen to work. And of course, actually, what had happened was that the current went off briefly, then on again, and then went off again, and then it stayed off. This has been a, a learning curve on all fronts. <laughs> so I think it's I think it's my. I've only had one other situation like this be once before. Uh, some time ago, um, I was asked to open a big conference, uh, a biological co on, on cell biology in, in Florence. <laughs> and um, I prepared a really um, sort of elegant lecture, which included quite a lot of Florentine stuff about what they would see in the music museums while they were there, which were relevant to, in fact, um, it was really about calcium. Um, it was really about calcium uh, metabolism. This 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 meeting, and um, that was its focus. So I thought very hard about calcium, and I came up with quite a lot of interesting things in the Uffizi in the Uffizi gallery. And I thought I would I thought I would I thought I would tease them with this. And as I was just about to leave for the airport to get to the airport to go to Florence to arrive there just in time for my talk, I found that my passport had been stolen. <laughs> So, so I, I, I almost cried actually, and I finally the, the, the Italian organisers were amazing. They got together with um, an internet connection. They set up my, I sent them my slides, 
and I gave the lecture from my from my dining room table, and they tell me it was a great success. But I I was almost in tears at the end. <laughs> sort of, I was just so horrified with what had happened. So that's happened once before, but that was about two years ago, two or three years ago. Um, and I and I said, well, I'm never going to use Zoom again. <laughs> So while we're sharing stories, maybe you can share a story from one of these other crises that you've, you know, been informing on and and how that's quite different to the current one or maybe how it just compares. Well, I think it's a very interesting question that um, I suppose the one that I was most closely uh, involved with was embryo research. Um, because, of course, you know, we were I suppose probably the leading leading lab doing embryo research in Europe, uh, and certainly the biggest IVF set up research wise. We were looking at gene expression in embryos and so on, and I and I th I was tangling for five years with you know with the pressures from religious communities and from others. Um, I did a huge amount of television work then. This is not doing documentaries. This was sort of between them, um, and giving a lot of interviews. And, and, and what was interesting was. That none of the arguments were wholly effective, but there were two which were which really worked. One was going on the Terry Wogan show. Do you remember Terry Wogan? He was he was the biggest watched um, uh, sort of uh, uh, anchor for a, a very good popular program. And of course, he was a Catholic, and therefore, of course, by nature concerned about you know the catholic position on embryos and he had in front of him two of the leading politicians who were adamant about the uh, the criminality of what people like me were doing they said i was a murderer uh, on television uh, one of them was was ann widdicombe who you might remember who was of course a, a, a very a prominent uh, religious mp at the time and i showed that actually i felt i had ethical principles as well in that in in that in that program, and that really, I think, made a difference with millions of people watching. And then the other thing was, when we had done the first embryo screening for genetic disorders of women who'd lost their babies, there were two couples we put embryos back in, and we didn't in, we didn't actually arrange this, but it turned out that when we were when we put our paper into nature explaining what we'd done nature actually got them photographed by the daily telegraph and they were the front page of the daily telegraph just about a week before a major parliamentary debate now that was that was maddox who did that john maddox did that of course i mean he 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 didn't tell the authors of the paper exactly what he was doing he just said we're going to have a press conference <laughs> but but i think what was important there was something really useful in public engagement, which I've never forgotten. What people want to know is what use is it? You know, where where's the evidence for success? And at the moment, that's still a bit of a problem with COVID because we don't yet have evidence of the success of the vaccines except in a theoretical trial. So I think we're going to see in several months time that success but of course, the problem I have, I think, with the massive publicity, of course, is that with any virus, with any um, vaccine, if you have a few really bad side effects, which are unexpected, though it doesn't look likely because now 10,000 doses have been given, there's going to be a real problem. So is there science that you think has been effective or that but has not been communicated well. And what can we do as a science community? Would you do better? Well, I, think, I, I think all the things we're doing, science-wise, I mean, I think, for example, um, have we thought about track and trace more properly? I mean, Christina nailed it completely with her talk. She was dead right about all the things she said. The logistics were rotten. Um, the, uh, the failure to have um, a, a rapid test back on time, which was quite possible with PCR. Um, so now, of course, we've got the flow technology that may be helpful as well, of course. Um, I know my colleagues at Imperial have got a kit, which means you can take it around to the house and get a, get a result very quickly. That will help. So I think, you know, have we been, and actually, of course, probably using um, 
using, uh, as Christina implied, uh, you know, I, um, software which actually had been proven of value and not worry too much about privacy, which of course we were so concerned about. Um, and I mean, there's personal privacy is important, but in fact, you know, our national privacy, I'm not sure that really that was so important here because of course, you know, when we weren't leave, leaving ourselves open, I think to cyber attack, particularly by using somebody else's, um, somebody else's uh, um, software. Um, so I think uh, with uh, antivirals, uh, that's a good story. It looks really as if we've got some niche antivirals. Uh, some, of course, we, we, we guessed might look like dexamethasone, of course, which isn't really antiviral, but it's very effective against things like cytolysis. Um, and um, I, I think, you know, the, the story of the vaccines is fantastic for one very interesting reason. It's one of the first times ever that the university has taken an idea and brought it to market right the way through. And it's a new model really for, for our inventiveness. Previously, of course, this is done very slowly through the research councils occasionally, but much more often, of course, it's done by big pharma. And in a sense, what we've done actually is to show that we can innovate in a way that was a bit unexpected from the record, from history, from from the historical uh, things, we've lost so many inventions in the past. You know, MR, MRI, for example, went overseas. We, we know it was one of our inventions. And the same applies with CAT scanning and a whole lot of other very important technologies we've lost because we didn't. You know, the ideas were developed in universities, but it never was taken up. We were very bad at the intellectual property. Thank you very much, Robert, for um, chatting with me today and, and with all of us. And uh, we look forward to hearing the rest of your talk later on today. Thank you so much, Anjali. Actually, I must tell you that uh, what happened to me has never quite happened before. Basically, some working, uh, some workmen in the working in the house next door fiddled with the electricity supply initially, and then finally when I was having difficulty at the time trying to get my uh, computer to work, cut off the electricity completely. And so I was without any internet connection or light or anything else. And I couldn't work out what was going wrong and then realized what had happened. And uh, so I apologize for that. I won't take too long over this because I feel it's, it's been a fantastic day. And I must say, listening, listening to Neil Lawrence, I, I, I feel that really it, that was a great way to end the day. So I don't really feel I want to go on a great, particularly, but I, I do think that his tenets that he mentioned the, at the end, really, really interesting. Uh, and I think that that aspect of collaboration is something that we do forget far too often. And indeed, I, I think that is part of the problem with our educational system, which I'm gonna talk about briefly at the end, if I may. But I just want to come back to this issue of, of public trust because it is really absolutely kernel to so much of what goes on. We cannot do anything which is going to be really effective without proper public trust. And certainly what we've seen with all the, uh, all the examples that I gave you from um, nuclear power to um, BSC to uh, let's say stem cell research, uh, there's been a failure of us as scientists to listen. I think Neil, uh, made the point that scientists have a lot to answer for, and I think he's right. Uh, we, we, we haven't mentioned much, of course, about media exaggeration and media stories, but certainly media have a role to play in some of, the, uh, some of the misapprehension of what's going on. The problem of hiding the truth has been something which was certainly listed there. And I think one of the issues at the moment is, uh, you know, I don't think we can get away quite so easily um, uh, not blaming the government. I think the gov I think government in general, politicians in particular, of both sides of the colour, have a great deal to answer for. And certainly, you know, as a parliamentarian, I, I see this all the time. A failure to answer the question is extremely common. And it's as common on almost as common on the Labour benches as it is on the on the government benches. And I think we have to understand that. The government tends to treat the public as lacking intelligence, and it should not do that. I say the publics, of course, because that's a big problem. And, and certainly one of, the, one of the real key issues I think that we've seen recently is a government which wants to keep to a message and actually is messaging rather than communicating. Uh, 
Messaging is one way, it's top down largely. Communicating is both ways, it's actually involved. We cannot communicate properly unless we're also listening. And really often the listening is more important than actually saying things. And then of course, these issues that I raised with some of the earlier examples I gave of commercial interests, lobbying, poor ethics. Um, certainly what we've seen here uh, recently is questions over government procurement not being answered, certainly not being answered in parliament. Um, and uh, we shouldn't forget as well that part of the problem why the NHS was so unprepared was the extraordinary length of austerity, which of course strapped, uh, strapped the NHS of cash it really needed as it did for so much of our poorer parts of our of our population who are also who also suffer much more as a result of the pandemic and uh, with regard to our scientists of course yes obviously you know sometimes we're not too good at speaking english by that i don't mean i don't mean people who come from a, a foreign country i mean english scientists not speaking english properly so i think there are many reasons for public trust uh, uh, failure and certainly um if you take the, the current pandemic, you know, the failure to make specific rec restrictions, for example, the two meter rule, uh, meaningful to the average person who can actually measure uh, that. And you can see so often, so many people breaking those rules. If you walk for on Hampstead Heath in this last shut lockdown, uh, runners bumping into you, for example, when in fact, that really is not acceptable, uh, not acceptable behavior. And, um, the government really avoid, avoided the implications of track and trace, and it was over-promising and under-providing on virus testing. Um, it was often keeping what it seemed to be the SAGE, the sage data uh, secret. Certainly, it was very difficult even for, uh, uh, for people in Parliament to get to the, some of the data, um, even on one of the select committees, which, I sit, which is the Science and Technology Select Committee, looking at the COVID issue. And the, the, the wanton exposure, of NHS workers to viral contamination. You know, some of, some of my own team, uh, certainly one of my postdocs and one of my PhD students, both of whom actually got COVID, were both actually working at the front, um, uh, at the front line and uh, doing their clinical work. And of course, they were not properly protected. And that really is absolutely shocking. Fortunately, they're both fine, but that might not have happened. There was also a lack of openness about the triage system in the NHS. It's quite clear that a number of patients were being told, well, we're not going to put you on a respirator because we don't think you're going to survive. And certainly that happened to one of my friends who did survive. And actually, of course, he didn't get on a respirator. But the awful feeling that actually he was being left potentially to die was something that really left him very, very seriously concerned for some weeks after he'd recovered from the virus. And I think one of the key issues is this constant confusion of ethical issues, which has been happening all the time. The confusion of the ethical issue, the central, the central aspect of trying to save life against securing the economy. Um, and of course, you know, as I mentioned with the aeroplane, this apparent restrictions on, on, on aircraft. I have to say that there are a number of organizations trying to look at trust. I, I sit on the, the uh, Council for Data Ethics and, uh, uh, and, Art and Intelligence. Uh, and, and innovation. And certainly I'm very grateful to Philippa Harlingham and Benedict Dello at, at the CDI who are doing some of the work looking at uh, public responses to some of these issues and the difference in different groups. I might just try, I think, in conclusion to show you uh, two uh, slides. I'm gonna try and share my screen again. So basically th this, this select committee inquiry, which was there when I was chairman, uh, all those years ago, we, we, what we saw was some common things which are still happening now. So, for example, it, it's clear that the purpose of science is is it, it is crucial for the public's response. And of course, now as people question authority more and more, we actually have to have an answer to that. And it certainly seems from various surveys that the public trust science much more when it seems to be given on an independent basis. And that actually the, the government uh, culture of institutional secrecy uh, in, uh, and actually what the, the select committee found was there is a UK culture of government and institutional secrecy, which is not acceptable. And uh, of course, also the way the science is pursued has a moral dimension, you know, uh, 
um, I, I think it's fair to say that science itself does not actually have um, a moral dimension, but the way it is pursued and the way it is researched certainly does have. And I think that's one of, one of the issues which we, uh, we need to look at. So I want to look at two lots of recommendations that our committee made before I conclude. One of the things, and it, you can see how many of these uh, recommendations have still not been fulfilled years later. First of all, one of the things we recommended was that the universities should ensure communication training for scientists. And that secondly, um, secondly, actually the research councils should encourage more sharing with the public. I think they've done that to a large extent, to be fair. So when you write for your project grant now, you are expected to put some public engagement in it, but it's not always checked on. And certainly it's much more still a ticking, a box ticking exercise. Um, secondly, I, I think there's a real, it was the Higher Education Funding Council then, of course, but there is a need to reward people who bring work to the public's attention. And I think that's important as well. We're doing much more for so-called women's understanding of science. I mean, I, I, I must say, I don't think that was a particularly helpful um, uh, wording for what was needed at that time. There were far too few women in, in science, not getting to the top of the science. That is changing and it still needs to change much more, but it's a hell of a lot better now, 20 years on. Um, uh, and th this old issue about the need to risk and uncertainty in more of a way, and the onus advice to government. So I, I, I think to conclude with these recommendations which we put in this report, we pointed out the need to be much more aware of the risks of commercialization um, and the need to establish uh, dialogue with the public. Now, uh, Natalie Banner made a very, very important point, I thought, in her, in her uh, talk just now, because Natalie pointed out that actually, in fact, that's that does actually have an effect. Uh, the the EPSRC, when I was on council, established a number of public dialogues. We did one on nanotechnology and we did one uh, on uh, synthetic biology. And what was really interesting about those dialogue processes, which was having scientists and the publics together in a room, each possessing their point, going away, thinking about it and coming back sometime later, and then re-continuing the conversation. What clearly showed was that the scientists actually changed sometimes the way they were doing their research and sometimes had new ideas about how their research might be more effective. And I think that's really interesting. I, public dialogue has certainly continued uh, with, uh, in, uh, in UKRI, but uh, with SciencewISE. But I, but I think actually the problem with uh, dialogue is that it's quite an expensive process but it certainly works. And in fact, it's one of the few examples where you can clearly demonstrate the metrics of effect. So this is something which in fact, that the select committee recommended, and it's something which of course has certainly come about. Um, this bedeviled question about peer review being extended to include people who are not the scientists. Um, now, all of us have different views about peer review. It's not a perfect system. I would certainly agree with that but it's probably the best system we've got. And if we're to, if we're to have peer review, then certainly to some extent, uh, the public need to be involved, I think, in that kind of process at certain level. But I want to conclude with this aspect of what I think is really important in our society. I think we're not a scientifically literate society. We are, we've been encouraging for years, uh, li literacy in the humanities and to some extent in the arts but we're woefully behind in science literacy. And in my view, as we said in this select committee report, it starts actually in primary schools. Unfortunately, if you look at primary school education, 93% of our teachers in primary school are female, which is unhelpful. Now, the female teachers are really good teachers, but very few of them have science education. Occasionally they might have one A-level in science, usually biology, and they're teaching science, but they're teaching science without a great deal of confidence, and they have to teach the whole aspect of, all aspects of science. And of course, they are wonderful role models, but of course, half their pupils will be female. And I think that often leads um, some uh, women, young women as they're growing up into teenagers, uh, 
to actually be somewhat inconfident about science. I think that is still happening. And to my mind, that's still not being grasped by society. I, I think the most single way you can really change a society is by improving its primary school education. But in our country, it's the least well-funded, it's the least well-respected, it's the poorest rewarded. And in fact, primary schools, particularly in the state sector, are really having a hugely difficult time of it. Um, and it, it is such, it's, it's really sad to me. L last week, I had the great privilege of talking to over a thousand uh, uh, primary school children using Zoom, uh, answering their questions for an hour. And they come out with the most wonderful questions. But it's very obvious from those questions that so much of that stuff is going unanswered at the present time. And it seems to me to be a, a, a really big issue. So let me finally conclude if I may, with just one point, because I realize that we're getting very late now, and it's the issue of vaccines. You know, it, it is fantastic, of course. It's a wonderful achievement that we've already got three apparently usable vaccines which have quite sufficient coverage. It doesn't need to be 90%. If it's 70% or even 60%, it will be adequate, of course, to make a massive difference to the pandemic. And eventually, of course, it will die out in the way that it did, for example, in 1665. People think the, uh, the, the, the Great Fire of L uh, L uh, London killed the pandemic, but actually, in fact, it was already dying out. What Daniel Defoe clearly showed is that by the time it was already, the, the actual uh, plague was extinct. So I think that getting that um, level of immunity will be really important in our society. But what we must not forget is that the ethics of vaccinology are very different from the ethics of any other treatment in medicine. Because when you're producing a vaccine, you are giving that vaccine to hundreds of thousands of people, none of whom who are ill. It's very different from taking a drug. So you are, in fact, dealing with a perfectly healthy person who you might make ill. Now, the thing that really worries me about the massive enthusiasm, the sanguine approach to vaccines at the moment, is that I think we have to be very much aware that we really must not be overconfident. It will be another example of where our communication is really quite, uh, needs to be very, very careful. We need to be very, very reserved about this. Because, of course, given the amount of people who are highly suspicious of science, given the number of people who are very suspicious about government, and given the fact that in some parts of the country, over 20% of the population are anti-vaccination, this is a very serious issue. You would not need many serious adverse events to occur with vaccination before you would totally destroy trust. And that would be a major problem for everybody if we're really going to control the pandemic. So I think we have to be aware of that. And I think, of course, how we handle the data from those vaccinations is going to be of colossal importance. And I think it needs also attitude, attitudes to the vaccines to be included. So I think we're winning and I think it's fantastic. It's amazing to think that this is the first time, I think for many, many, many generations actually that, are, that, are, that are, um, if you like, an innovation at university level has gone right the way through to market. This really is, I think, a great, a great credit to British education, British universities, and British science. But actually, we need to ensure that that education is seamless, really, from the age of five and six upwards. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, if you don't mind, and if you will grace us, we've got two questions for you, one from the audience and one as sort of a wrap up um, a key message question. So the question from the audience is, does the fact that vaccine test findings have been published, but the data not publicly released, put more pressure on the regulators to approve them? Absolutely right question. It's, I mean, that's exactly the right question. We're being, we're being told that we've got this wonderful vaccine, but I, you, have not seen the data. Uh, we need to see that. We need to see the data. And really, what, what, at the moment, we have to trust that the regulators are really doing the job that we hope that they're doing. But of course, that's, that's a problem. I mean, I think they almost certainly are, 
um, but it's a very, very important question. Thank you. And so a final question, and really this is about um, a, a message, uh, a final message, which is uh, Dame Wendy Hall in, in chairing the panel session uh, asked her panelists at the end um, for this, what they would recommend in as scientists yeah. or speaking yeah. to government and government speaking to scientists, that communication. And so as someone who has been you know, active in, in speaking and communicating science to the public, what would your message be for scientists communicating with government, government communicating with scientists, and both of them communicating with the public? I thought, it was, by the way, I thought it was a tremendously good panel. I, I really enjoyed listening to Wendy and um, it was great to hear uh, Neil Ferguson uh, as well, of course, as well as as well as Michaela and and and, and, and Natalie, um, but I think it would come back to my last point. You know, I thought about answering that question, which is why I put that point just in just now. I I, I think it's the need to understand we have to have science literacy. You know, I was brought up in a school where, of course, you knew about Shakespeare, you spoke a foreign language, you had some Latin, but science wasn't at all important. You had to understand the classics. And that has actually pervaded our society. It's not nearly like it was, but actually we see, we see science far too much as something of commercial interest. You're gonna get a better job if you do science. And actually, I think we need to see science as just having knowledge. And children in primary school, young age, absolutely gobble that knowledge up. <laughs> asking, I mean, I do, I, I Zoom my grandchildren at the moment. I did, I did a session um, the night before last. And it's very, very difficult because I asked, very difficult, these are quite small kids. The oldest is only 12 and the youngest is a lot younger, but they ask really impossible questions. But that, that appetite, that appetite for knowledge is something that we tend to kill. And we kill it because we're inconfident in schools of giving them the answer and we're very inconfident about doing an experiment because in fact of all the people teaching science you know only about you know the, the number of people teaching science in in primary school very few of them have got a science degree and i think that's something we need to value much more we need to value them and ensure actually that we change that position because i think that is a a vein that runs through our society and it's one that needs to be greatly improved